Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon, Women Scholars During COVID-19, Solutions for Gender Equity in Academia. I'm Gloria Blackwell, AAUW Senior Vice President of Fellowships and Programs, and I will be your host for this afternoon's webinar. Um, we are uh, excited to partner with GEICO that is assisting in the funding of this particular webinar. So thank you to GEICO for making this possible. You will see at the bottom of your screen, there, are, there will be a chat box. If you have any questions during the webinar uh, about Zoom or you're having any technical difficulties, our great AAUW team is available to help you uh, with any of those uh, questions. There's also an actual questions box, Q&A at the bottom of your screen as well, if you have any questions during uh, the proceedings. But I want to let you know that because we asked for your great questions in advance, uh, that Dr. Malish has already seen those questions, uh, many of which will be answered throughout the presentation. And then time permitting, we will have an opportunity to take care of some of those at the end. And also, it would be extremely helpful if you wait until uh, towards the end if you submit your questions, because sometimes it can be just a little bit distracting as you're entering things into the Q&A box. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. This really is an important conversation that we're going to have today around uh, solutions for gender inequity in academia. Uh, at AAUW, we know all too well the impact of COVID-19 COVID on higher education. This past academic year, we had over 250 recipients, and in the springtime, everything was disrupted as COVID-19 struck uh, with a vengeance and everyone was turned upside down. Uh, students needed to go home and have Zoom college, uh, scholars had their research disrupted, uh, dissertations uh, went online and they were the Zoom uh, defenses of dissertations, not to mention all of the quarantining and social distancing that had to happen. Um, and obviously mental health and many other issues that went along with that. And so we know that all of those challenges definitely amplified um, women's ability to be successful in their in their research and their studies and also uh, may have um, sort of an unintended negative consequence on their career advancement. So I'm really happy today to be able to introduce you to uh, Dr. Jessica Malish, who is an assistant professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland, uh, my home state. And uh, she's also the Director of Research and Epidemiology with the St. Mary's County Health Department. So those are very, it's a very interesting role to have at a very interesting time. Uh, and uh, she is also one of our fantastic AUW 2019-2020 uh, American Fellows who was in the midst of her fellowship program uh, when the pandemic hit. And so we're very excited to have her here today. Now her research, uh, focuses on vertebrate stress response and the effects of stressors on physiology and behavior and how the response to challenges influences fitness. Now, I will admit, I, I'm not really sure what that means, but she's not actually here to talk about that today. Today, we're going to talk about a different subject. Uh, she recently co-published an, uh, an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences entitled, In the Wake of COVID-19, Academia Needs New Solutions to Ensure Gender Equity. And so today, she's going to share her research findings and really discuss the importance of diversity in academia. The challenges that women faced, obviously, uh, pre-pandemic, because those challenges were already in place and how the pandemic has amplified those challenges and not just talking about the challenges, but also talking about the solutions. So welcome, Dr. Jessica Malish. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm really excited to be here today and to be involved in an AAUW event. Um, oh, of course, my dog's going to bark now. 
Um, all righty. So as I was just introduced so kindly, um, yeah, I am an assistant professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland, and I am also the director of research and epidemiology at St. Mary's County Health Department, which is a very interesting, exciting time to be involved with the health department. I wanted to get started by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so COVID-19 and me. So it was my path that got me involved in this important conversation about gender equity in academia. And so this is a picture going quite a ways back to about 2001 before I went to grad school when I was first deciding to go on a career in academia. And I wanted to point out that two women really inspired me to pursue a career in academia. And they both were um, impactful during my final year of my undergraduate studies at the Uni University of North Carolina, Wilmington. One of those was Professor and Dr. Sue Chrissy, who at that time was studying um, zoo nutrition. So what she would do is she would go out in the wild and she would look at animals as they ate things. She would analyze what they were eating. She would analyze their feces. She would determine what nutrients those animals were getting. And then she would try and find similar foods that were available at zoos. So those animals were still getting their same needs met. And I thought that was a really interesting applied ecological physiology topic. Uh, it was the first time I really thought about research as a career. And then there was another individual who really inspired me during my undergraduate career. And this individual came and gave a job, no, it wasn't a job talk, sorry. It was a invited talk also at UNC Wilmington. And I don't know who she is. So if she's possibly watching or you know who she is, please let her know that she made a huge impact on my decision to go into a career in ecological and physiological research. This individual studied seals and she was trying to determine where they were, where they were foraging. Was it in a freshwater or a saltwater environment? And she was able to figure it out by analyzing the lipid composition of their fat stores. And I was just blown away that they, you could use ecological physiology to answer that question. Um, so I really started to think about maybe I want to go on and do um, something with research. So in 2002, I went to UNC, or to <laughs> University of California, Riverside. And I was there for five and a half years where I completed my dissertation. That is also where I had my eldest child here, Emmett. So he is my PhD baby. Um, I had him in my last semester as a PhD student. Luckily, the UC system has dissertation year fellowships, which was really helpful and giving me a year to really focus on writing and finishing up. So that was fantastic and supportive. Um, I did my postdoc from 2007 to 2010 at the University of Montana in Kriya Bruner's lab. It was also an extremely supportive uh, woman mentor in STEM and a fantastic advisor where I was studying white crown sparrows and stress physiology in Yosemite. And that is where I had my second, uh, and his name is Sawyer. And then after that, I went on to become a visiting assistant professor, as many of us do in academia when we're trying to balance academia and family. And so this, was a good, this worked out well for me to be a visiting assistant professor at the Claremont Colleges. And I was there from 2010 to 2016. And I took a small gap while I was there for one year to have number three, that is Ranger, who I thought would definitely end my career in academia, but I was able to go back to the Claremont Colleges after he was born. And so first for about two years, I was at the Claremont Colleges at Ranger and then went back for a few more years um, and really enjoyed being a professor. And so I went out on the job market in 2015 and landed my tenure track job. So I got it done at St. Mary's College of Maryland. So I started at SMCM in the fall of 2016. So I managed to pull off the uh, tenure track position with these three. So hopefully that is an inspiration to some of you. Um, this is the three, my three kids and I in Yosemite, they go with me every year to do my research on white crown sparrows with me. Um, so that's June or July in Yosemite where it's still quite snowy. All right, so I got the tenure track position and enjoyed it, but I noticed some challenges. And those included that I had really big research aspirations. There's big things I wanted to do, uh, but I was at a small liberal arts college, which I love. I love mentoring undergraduate research. So the college is an excellent place for me. 
Um, but I have these big research aspirations, but not a ton of money um, available. Some, a respectable amount, but not enough to reach my aspirations. And so I decided pretty early on that what I really need is the NSF career grant to get the research done that I want to get done. However, another challenge is that I have the teaching load that's typical of a small liberal arts college. Uh, so that's th a three, three, three classes in the fall, three classes in the spring. And also the service load typical of a small liberal arts college where we really value our one-on-one -on -one time with students in small classes, um, advising, research mentoring, so, and then other you know, general service activities. So with those things, I was, you know, it would be a challenge to find the time to apply for the NSF career grant, which was my a big goal. So our amazing Office of Research and Sponsors Program. So I wanna give a big shout out to Dr. Sabina Dillingham, who works at St. Mary's College of Maryland. And she told me that the solution to my problems was to apply for an AAUW fellowship. Uh, she said, if I got this American fellowship that it would give me extra money for a year, I could use it to reduce my course load. I could use it to pay for childcare for my kids. Um, and I could use it to help get to the field. I would have more time to write my career grant. And so I applied and I got it. And it was really, really exciting. And I was looking forward to my 2019, 2020 year with great expectations. And we all know what happened in the 2019, 2020 year, right? So COVID happened. And so I lost that childcare that I had been able to fund with my AAUW fellowship because it was at the children's school and the children's school was closed. I had three kids who were doing virtual learning, all different grades, including a seven-year-old who was learning to navigate online schooling. I had an increase in mentoring because one, women are known to carry a heavier mentorship load and then we were in a time of increased need where students were needing more support. But also I direct many student research projects and students were, had to leave campus. And so I was having to go into campus to finish their projects for them. There were tons of meetings, <laughs> so many meetings. It felt like there were all the regular meetings and then all of the, how are we gonna deal with COVID meetings? And so what it felt like was all of my time was going to childcare, virtual learning, mentoring students and meetings. And there was no time for research or writing. And my anxiety was, was increasing as I was thinking, what if I can't get my grant done? And as I looked around and I saw women going through similar struggles, particularly in social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, in my academic mama's group, people were mentioning, you know, I can't get anything done. All I'm doing is getting my basic work done, my mentoring, my meetings, keeping things, keeping one nostril above water, but my research is plummeting. And I started to worry not only about, you know, what I get my career grant done, but I really started to worry about women in general and academia and how this was gonna affect them, particularly at tenure and promotion, which is already a tenuous time. So I called my friend Bree. So this is Bree. We went to grad school together and she's now a research assistant professor at Texas Tech. We tend to go to meetings together. We talk a lot about the challenges of being a woman and a mother in academia. And so I called her and we started discussing some of the things we were seeing on social media about how COVID was impacting our promise of tenure and promotion. And we decided we needed to do something. And Bree and I decided that we were gonna write an opinion piece and we wanted to publish it in PNAS, so Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which we knew was a lofty goal that I'd previously published in PNAS as a co-author on an opinion piece about the child care conference conundrum and how women with children have difficulty attending conferences at a really important part of their academic career. Um, and so I, I knew a little bit about the path thanks to the lead author, Rebecca Khaleesi. So Dr. Khaleesi um, from UC Davis, she had led that paper. So I want to acknowledge her amazing mentorship in sort of showing me the ropes, how to publish an opinion piece in PNAS. So I kind of knew a little bit about how to get started and she helped me along the way. Um, but I also knew the important part of this piece was not just to be waving our arms and saying, oh no, a crisis is coming, but to try to come up with tangible solutions. And so that was our goal. We wanted to highlight gender inequity in academia. We wanted to talk about how COVID-19 had amplified that um, disparity. 
And then most importantly, we wanted to offer up some solutions, a starting point, anything to help institutions grapple with the potential impending loss of women from academia. And so we reached out to a to our colleagues that we knew who had similar interests, who were very driven to confront gender e equity issues in academia. Uh, so Brie reached out to some folks. I reached out to some folks. I also pinged a few people that I just saw on social media that were saying the same things. Uh, one in person I'll introduce you to, Stephanie Shepard. I particularly remember her lamenting the 10 year clock extension and saying how she would write a book about why that wasn't gonna help. Um, and I thought, okay, I need to contact this person. So we generated this amazing network of 17 women, showing you eight of us right now. Um, so these 17 women, so Karin, Jimena, Jacqueline, Jen, Bree, Liz, Christy, and I. And then also Pump to It, Naima, Jessica, Latha, Stephanie Shepard, who was the one I found on Facebook, um, Shannon, Jessica, and Amelia. And the 17 of us got together. Well, she's, yeah, this, got together. And what we did is we, um, on a Google Doc, and over, I think, two Zoom meetings, and over not the course of, somewhere between one and two weeks, we're able to put together this manuscript. It was a huge Google Doc, and luckily we had Dr. Shear, who I like to call Dr. Shear slash and burn, to go through and bring down our huge volume of information down to something that PNAS might accept. Um, and it turned out to be a, a significant publication. It came out in July, so we ended up all of this publishing in the wake of COVID-19. Academia needs new solutions to ensure gender equity. Um, not only am I really proud of this piece and the impact it's had, um, the whole experience of finding and working with these 17 amazing women was really transformative and a really wonderful outcome of my AAUW award because without that award, I don't think I would have had the confidence to tackle this project. And I also had a little bit more time than some people who, because I had some course releases. So I had a little more time to tackle this project and to think about it. Um, so I really want to acknowledge AAUW's role. This paper would not have been written without this fellowship. Okay, so the bulk, so now you have the intro to the paper and a little bit of my history. So for the talk outline, I'm gonna talk about diversity in academia and why it's a must the pre-COVID-19 landscape for women in academia, including leaky pipeline, our uphill battle, and our uphill battle with a heavier load, and how COVID-19 added to that increased um, workload. And then really importantly, what are some possible solutions? So first, diversity in academia is a must. And I know I probably don't need to talk to this group that much about that, but I really wanted to highlight the words of Dr. Hoyer, who published a report, Is the Gender Gap Narrowing in Science and Engineering? And in this report, she investigated a bunch of different metrics, but she had this quote that really resonated with me. And that quote is, gender equality will encourage new solutions and expand the scope of research. It should be considered a priority by all if, by all, if the global community is serious about reaching the next set of developmental goals. And so I just really like how she sets it up as, we need gender equality to have new solutions and expand our scope of research. Our research will be better if we have gender equality. And for that reason, we need to make it a priority if we're serious about reaching our next set of goals, if we don't wanna stagnate. So I like that she set it up as the importance of gender equality um, beyond being fair, which is a word I loathe. Another individual, Dr. Burt, has also been instrumental in pursuing gender equity um, in the academy. And she wrote a paper, The Three Reasons Gender Diversity is Crucial to Science. And one of her quotes that really struck me was her saying that, but the need for more women in science goes beyond issues of fairness and ethics. And that really resonated because I don't like the word fair anyway, um, but it's beyond ethics. So our world would be better off with more women in the labs, clinics, and clinical trials. So really recognizing that not having women in these labs is actually 
a decrement to the academy, right? So this, we want to encourage equity, not for fairness purposes, but because it, it's better for academia. Now, in the report I mentioned two slides back by Dr. Hoyer, she included this um, telling um, graphic. And what we're seeing is the distribution of engineering researchers globally. And each pie graph is on a country and it represents the total number of engineers shown in green are men and in purple are women. And so it's obvious that, especially when we look at the field of engineering, that the number of women doing research in those fields globally is not anywhere near parity with our male colleagues. Um, so we do need, we need diversity in academia. Achieving diversity in academia has been an uphill battle, even pre COVID-19 for women. And for several reasons, but there's leaky pipeline, uphill battle and the heavier load. So the leaky pipeline, you're probably familiar with this figure, you've seen it in different forms. This also comes from Dr. Hoyer's report and I really liked her, her graphic here. And what we're looking at is that 53% of bachelor's degrees are being, um, are being awarded to women. About an equal percentage of graduate students are female. However, when we moved up beyond a master's degree into PhD, that number drops by about 10%. And then it drops precipitously for women who end up pursuing a career in research. So the pipeline is very leaky. And I would like to say that academia is gonna need more than band-aids to put to, to mend the already leaky pipeline. Like we didn't have it, it wasn't, we, we started out with a leaky pipeline and now it's going to hemorrhage. We cannot um, rely on band-aid solutions. Gonna need more than that. And so pre-pandemic, <laughs> things are hard for women. I didn't list them all here, but I threw in a few of my um, ones that come to mind. One is that women tend to carry a high, higher service load. We're asked to do more service. We're more likely to say yes to that service. And we are also more likely to be, be viewed harshly if we don't um, say yes to that service. We end up with more mentoring, both because we get assigned more mentees, but also because students seek us for mentoring, given the tendency for women to be more nurturing. Often we are assigned higher teaching loads with larger classes that are for lower level students and sometimes non-majors. And I call this service teaching, or lots of people call this service teaching, right? A heavy load of students, um, large classes who are either not majors or early in their um, early in their academic career. And what this ends up with is that you have women carrying a much heavier teaching load. If you look at just class to class, you might like one person teaching class, another teaching class, you might miss it. But if you really analyze what are those classes, what are you expecting the students to accomplish? Women end up with a higher teacher, teaching load. Um, furthermore, women tend to occupy more contingent positions and for a longer period of time. And I think of myself who was in a visitor position for um, five years split across six years. Um, that's, a rel that's a long time to be in a visiting position. That's a significant delay to starting a tenure track and starting putting money away toward um, things like retirement, et cetera. Women experience bias teaching evaluations. That's very well established. Further establishes bias in evaluation for tenure promotion, especially when tenure clock stoppages are taken into account, bias in peer review, bias by grant committees. We get fewer invited speaking positions. So thank you AAUW for inviting me here. We unfortunately experience microaggressions in the workplace. And of course there's the motherhood tax where women with children are less likely to um, successfully get a tenure track position and also less likely to get tenure in that tenure track position as compared to their child free women counterparts and absolutely compared to their with or without children male counterparts. 
So not an exhausted list, um, but there they are. We do have a, we, referring to my um, all of my co-authors, have an extensive list of these articles if you want to look them up at acad academicequity.smcm.edu. But we're putting as many resources as we can find to help uh, women in academia deal with the impact of COVID-19. So what does COVID-19 add? to this already precarious situation? Well, it adds, we were already trying to balance teaching service and research and teaching was already likely heavier and service heavier than it was for research for women. In addition, we've now added online teaching, which if you have a larger class, it's gonna be more of a challenge, more students emailing you. I think that gets forgotten that all of those students will email you for support, um, advising of students online, class management online for larger classes, obviously homeschooling children, children learning virtually, um, supporting that is an, an enormous struggle. Uh, dependent care, so now having children at home now during the day and no child care options, all of these things and increased mentoring, I failed to mention that. So if you already had more students you were mentoring during the time of the pandemic, they're going to be coming to you more with their concerns because they're stressed. Um, they need your support, so they're going to seek that out. So given all of these things, it's no surprise that women are seeing their research time greatly diminished. And papers are coming out, uh, research papers are confirming our earliest fears. Um, so and this was one paper by Collins et al. about COVID-19 and the gender gap in work hours. And what they found was that mothers with young children have reduced their work hours four to five times more than fathers. So consequently, the gender gap in work hours has grown by 20 to 50% during COVID. Um, and yet another paper, um, they found that this paper was looking at productivity and productivity as papers being written. Their findings revealed that male academics, especially childless ones, were the least affected group. Whereas female academics, particularly black women and mothers were the most impacted groups. Um, so groups that were most likely to already be facing many of these barriers were getting impacted the most by COVID-19. And there are many more articles and they're on our um, SMCM academic equity webpage that is a supplemental webpage to the PNAS paper. So the link is in the paper if you wanna look it up. And I finally would like to quote one of my, what I think was one of the most impactful statements in the PNAS paper and was really my motivation to get the paper out is that to make matters worse in times of stress, such as pandemics, biased decision-making processes are favored, which threaten to deprioritize equity initiatives. So the concern here is that at a time when we have equity issues and the pandemic has magnified those equity issues. We also have on top of that, that if equity isn't being taken as a high priority and it is being aware that during these time periods is when equity measures will get put on the back burner, um, there's a real threat there. And I saw it happening you know, at my institution and other institutions where equity wasn't taking the forefront other pressing concerns were. And when there are many pressing concerns, you can see it's hard to prioritize, but academia needs to recognize the importance of gender equity and keep it high on the priority list and not put it off till later when we've lost too many women from academia. Papers are coming out day after day about the impact of COVID. There's no doubt that there is, that COVID-19 is amplifying gender inequity in academia. Um, and in a recent, paper, uh, a recent issue of the New York Times in an article called Women in Academia, Academia Face a New Burden, I really like this quote from Dr. Escalon. She's at University of Oregon. And she said, I hope the administration realizes that anything they do now to alleviate this issue for caregivers will directly impact how the professorate will look five to 10 years from now. How diverse it will be and how many women will be, how, and how many women will be in positions of power within academia. I think recognizing the impact and the importance of this on um, what academia will look like long-term, like this isn't a short-term problem. This is a problem that has the 
potential to really alter the landscape of academia in the next five to 10 years and really decrease all of the diversity that we have been working so hard to foster. Okay, so moving on to what we're the meat, what are the solutions, right? And the only real solution is the classic one, a long-term investment in gender equality. And this was said by Alessandra Manello in her um, paper, The Pandemic and the Female Academic, which came out very early in um, the pandemic, came out in Nature and was a real inspiration piece for my PNAS paper. So how do we invest in gender equality? Well, I have a three-step program. <laughs> Step one, you gotta admit there's a problem. Um, and a lot of institutions aren't admitting they have a problem, but th there is a problem. So institutions without even regard to COVID-19 need to evaluate gender inequities in service. Are those equitable amongst your colleagues or and amongst the faculty members? Really analyze the types of service, what are the time commitments and what are the prestige associated with those? And is that equitable? The institution also needs to evaluate gender inequities in teaching. And like I said before, really investigate who is teaching the larger classes, who's teaching the lower division classes, who's teaching the non-majors in these service courses. Weigh those courses based on student likelihood of students needed, needing additional assistance um, and the number of students um, and, and weigh that, take that into account when coming up with a metric, maybe call on your economist to help come up with some sort of metric so you can really analyze it for your institution. They should evaluate inequities in research. Have you been, have institutions been providing the same level of support for research, the same level of startup funds? Have they provided the same access to graduate students or funding of graduate students, things like that? Really do some statistics and determine um, if it's equitable or not. Um, Institutions also need to investigate inequities in salary. We see this frequently. We know that there's inequity in salary for academics. Women are paid a, a specific percentage less than men on average. Um, so that needs to be taken into account. When all of this information is gathered, institutions need to develop the goals and actual plans to eliminate the disparities. So set the goal. Is parity the goal? And what does parity mean to you? Does parity mean equal numbers? Or does it mean that equal voices are heard? So if one group is louder than another, do they have equal numbers or do they have fewer numbers to make sure that parity is actually achieved? So institutions need to develop actionable plans to eliminate these disparities. So step one, admit there's a problem and have data because people respond well to data and convince your faculty members that there's a problem. Um, and I loved this quote that I found on uh, Twitter one day when looking to see who had shared the PNAS piece. And I love that this individual had said, there's no better time to start to rethink some of the systemic inequities that women face in academia. Any promotion and tenure process that does not account for these issues, especially now, sets so promising faculty up for failure. And I couldn't agree more. So what's the next step? We need to triage the impacts of COVID-19 on women, particularly focusing on expectations for tenure and promotion. Those tenure and promotion expectations need to be adjusted. A gender neutral tenure clock um, pause is not going to help. It's going to be the same as when it's provided for childcare. It's gonna be used in different ways. In general, it will not provide um, the support we're looking for. What we need is for this time during the pandemic to be treated as a different time where that tenure and promotion expectations are not the same, that they get altered um, in a way that promotes equity and retention of women and any underrepresented groups in um, academia. We need to provide resources to facilitate a research rebound. So, Resources should be provided to individuals who have faced serious impacts of COVID-19 on their research so that they can rebound that research. That might be providing summer salary for individuals who can express a need in a really clear COVID-19 impact on their research. Um, research funds in general, perhaps funds for postdoctoral and graduate students. Um, these would particularly benefit women who, um, who have labs, 
female postdoctoral scholars and graduate students are attracted to labs with female PI. So you can really um, magnify that money by providing it in those locations. Course releases, if it's deemed that certain individuals are carrying a higher course load, well, now would be a great time to make that right and provide course releases to those individuals while they're rebounding from COVID-19. Another idea is major compensation for childcare costs. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, I had money for childcare, but no childcare was open, so that didn't matter. But once there is a relaxation, once it's safe to do so, um, they can provide compensation to provide childcare, maybe during the summer, to allow women to rebound their research careers. In our paper, we propose the establishment of a pandemic faculty merit committee who would be diverse and informed, transparent and proactively trained. They would need to guide faculty in how to assess the impact of the pandemic on their academic career and help them negotiate measures that enhance the retention of women in research. And in our paper, we provided this figure that has some starting points. You know, it says this evaluation committee needs to be diverse, informed, transparent, proactive, and be trained. They need to understand the differential impacts of the careers on women of COVID-19 on the careers of women and be asking the right questions, the correct questions about teaching, about research and service. And these questions and more can be found at academicequity.smcm.edu and in the supplement to the PNAS paper. And um, we listed out some questions that could be used to guide some form of, um, to guide the committee in evaluating the impacts of COVID-19 and then finding resources to ameliorate those impacts. Step three is to reevaluate the more is more expectation. We have been in a time where we keep producing more and more research and expecting more and more from academics, and it's getting to be at a breaking point, and nothing has shown that more than COVID-19. There wasn't really any more room left to lean and to see what's happened to women's research careers uh, due to COVID-19 really illuminates that we need to reduce this more is more expectation. And there is an excellent paper that came out in Cell by Gibson et al., um, about how supportive early career researchers can reset science in the post-COVID-19 world. So if we really want to change this more is more expectation, this paper gives really great insight into how we can do that uh, broader. My paper talks mostly about te at tenure and promotion, and this focuses more broadly on what can be done across academia and with funding agencies, et cetera, to reevaluate the more is more expectation. So finally, I want to close with a quote from the PNAS paper, which is, to affect real change, it is necessary to change how the academy thinks about gender equity and equity for all academics. I wanna take time to acknowledge the amazing uh, women mentors that I have had throughout my academic career. This is Dr. Kriya Bruner. She was my postdoc advisor and really showed me how to um, navigate academia and also navigate parenting. My current Department chair is Dr. Eileen Bailey, and she has been also a wonderful mentor and supportive individual giving guidance as I've navigated my career and some of my most recent career changes. Dr. Miriam Priest was the department chair at the Claremont Colleges while I was a visitor there, and she was always very supportive of me throughout my time there, helped me with applications, advice for job interviews, and she's still someone I go to now for career advice. Dr. Katie Gantz is the Associate Dean of Faculty at St. Mary's College of Maryland, and she has provided amazing mentorship and professional development for myself and many other junior faculty members. Um, so she's been phenomenal and wouldn't be where I am without her. And then finally, I wanna acknowledge Dr. Mina Brewster, who is actually now my new current supervisor at my directorship with the health department. And she has um, helped me make this interesting career transition. And I will be forever grateful for the opportunity she's given me to be a leader in public health. And with that, I can take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Malik. That was, it, it was um, just wonderful the way that you laid out pre-pandemic impact of pandemic and solutions because I think you know sometimes when we start hearing about all of the challenges for women in academia which you only touched upon just a small 
small part Mm -hmm. can sound overwhelming. And, you know, I think that it's not just about, you know, elevating the issues, but also elevating solutions, uh, which is really Mm -hmm. important. And, um, you know, and I also think that's probably our first webinar where we got to see a snake, a koala, and and a frog. (laughs) looking at as you were sharing your story, but I think it's important that we hear about people's stories uh, and your journey. And, you know, as a mom of three myself, you know, I'm struck also by your the combination of motherhood and, and academia and knowing what a challenge that is. So knowing that uh, the, the child care was closed and then your children were resume schooling, how how do you balance uh, work? Family? <laughs> yeah, so that's such a good question, um, and I shy away from the word balance because I think it makes it sets up a dichotomy. What makes you feel like you're failing at both? That's right. Um, <laughs> I call it I call it work life harmony. Oh, there we go. I've also heard work life existence, <laughs> um, coordination. I like coordination a lot as well. Because, yeah, it's really hard to balance. Um, And so, you know, and it's also a pendulum. So sometimes you're focused more on one than the other. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other or or that you're doing both at the same time, right? But it's sort of a pendulum. So you can spend a little more time focusing on one and one more on the other. Um, One thing that I think of also when we think about work-life balance and some people will say, well, you know, you feel like you're expected to be an academic, like you don't have children, and then parent, like you don't have a career in academia, which I think is true. Um, but I have tried really hard um, to find institutions where I don't think, think that's true. You know, I was really attracted to St. Mary's College of Maryland when they said something in the interview like, well, we're never going to give you an 8 a.m. class because you have kids to get on the bus. And I was like, I was taken aback, but that was at all in the consideration when setting the course schedule. I thought for sure, well, you're new here and we don't want to teach 8 a.m., so it's you. Um, But no, and like for a long time until very recently, I hadn't taught an 8 a.m. class on campus, um, which was really helpful because it turned out they knew the bus schedule for the area. And sure enough, that's what I was going to be doing. So, um, yeah, so it's coordination. And I think finding ways that you can merge it a little more can sometimes ease the stress and maybe not seeing them as so divided. Um, I worked with some colleagues to arrange a way to get a bus to drop kids off on campus after school and that saved us all a little bit of work time and we could take turns being the point person getting the kids off the bus and getting them to be our colleagues offices. So that, you know, worked well and my, you know, my eldest son loved getting dropped off at the college. (laughs) <laughs> he loves showing off to his friends in junior high, and I, I get dropped off at the college, and then I walk to the office. So that was really helpful, Think, finding little ways like that to kind of make them work together. Um, I take my kids with me every year to Yosemite for my field season, which is a challenge, no doubt, but also it's become like our family's thing. Like that's part of our lives. We all expect to go and spend part of our summer at a cabin in Yosemite. And so for them, it's like a vacation in their minds, even though for me, it's work. And um, let's see, anything else do I have on? I think setting good schedules and good boundaries and good communication. If you aren't parenting alone, if somebody's helping you, having really good open communication and boundaries about who's doing what and making sure that's equitable because it's easy for it to slide. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question about um, how, the question is, is there any additional ways during the pandemic to still get funding to complete a dissertation. Now, I can answer part of that question because AAUW fellowships and awards are open. Um, Most of the deadlines are between now and December 31st. So definitely visit AAUW.org if you're interested in uh, graduate level funding. But I also know that our partners, our, our colleagues who are also in the funding world Um, everyone's programs for the most part are up and running. We are connected through the fellowships uh, working group uh, with many, many uh, funders from across the country. And one of the things that we had a recent conversation about was the impact of COVID 
on our programs uh, and how we needed to be much more flexible and that we had many of us needed to take a look at our guidelines, had to take a look at some of the expectations. And in particular, when we're looking at even the next academic year, you know, there were, you know, there are still applicants who are struggling to get the required documentation from their campuses or can't say if they're going to be on campus next year, if they're an international recipient, you know, whether or not they're going to be able to get a visa to come here. And so COVID-19 has magnified all of those challenges that were already in existence, but definitely uh, the resources for graduate level dissertation writing postdocs, the resources uh, for the most part are still there and AAUW's commitment certainly has not decreased. Yeah, that was my answer, AAUW. <laughs> I talk about it at all of my presentations now whenever I'm interacting with graduate students or colleagues. I emphasize it, really go check it out. This is an amazing organization that's there to help support university women, you know, like you can actually talk about. It's like I know in my application, I talk about what a challenge it is to do a field season with children. Like that's a known additional impact that makes it harder for women in academia if you're trying to do field work. And so I was actually able to talk about that in my proposal, which was was wonderful to actually get an opportunity to talk about it. And yeah, most places are open. I know NSF has funding sources for graduate students and there's usually right. institutions have some funding as well. So the next question came in from participants is how can we better teach young women to take opportunities and not wait till they are fully qualified, which may be an illusion. <laughs> yeah, so I would say the best way to do that is to mentor it, right? To mentor, to display it by mentoring, show that you're willing to take those risks as well. If you have a grad student or an undergrad who's saying they might apply for something, but maybe they aren't qualified, encourage them to take a shot. Um, one thing I like to tell the students I work with is you know, I've never regretted writing. I maybe didn't want to do it at the time. I maybe didn't want to write that statement. Or, but in the end, I was really glad I had it. You can recycle it later. You really develop your writing skills. Do the applications. Apply. You'll become a better writer. You know, apply for the grant. Apply for this. Even if you not don't think you're going to get it, you just never know. Um, and you will have worked on an important skill in the process. So it is not a loss if you don't get it. Um, yeah, so I would say model, model model going out and going for it anyway, um, having a growth mindset that a lot of times these job ads are written with a preference listed as a qualification, but it's really a preference. And so also as leaders, we can write our job ads better so that we aren't putting in preferences as required elements. So we aren't discouraging individuals. And definitely, you know, when we're writing job ads, including evidence of how we support diversity in our institutions, illustrating it instead of just saying we encourage diverse applicants. Like, hmm, that's not really gonna, that's not gonna change anything. But if you can articulate what you're doing to support your faculty members, that'll go further. And I encourage my students, you know, and now is gonna be tough. It's a tough job market this year. Um, so you can't be as choosy but to really look at institutions and ask them the hard questions about what they do to promote um, equity and diversity in their institution and look for solid answers, especially if you have more than one offer. Right, if you, if you <laughs> yeah. in that state, which as you mentioned, is a bit rare these yeah. people. Uh, and along those same lines, uh, someone asked, what can retired college women do to help, is there a role for women who may have been in academia and, and who are now retired? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and as I tried to highlight throughout my talk, the role of strong women mentors is key in retaining women um, and, and getting them through tenure and promotion. Um, it's women, female mentors have at every stage of my career been really instrumental. So if they can provide that, if they can reach out to either their you know, degree granting institution or a local institution that they're near to provide any mentoring, any webinars, um, 
some sort of conduit that helps them help junior women continue through the ranks. Um, and I'm in it in a very supportive way, not in a, you know, lean in harder sort of way, but like help them make connections, help them find funding sources, things like that, that are um, challenging, especially for junior faculty members who are just balancing so much. They might not even have the time to look for grants and things like that. So I think offering up mentorship, of course, if you have the means, donate to AAUW or any other institution that's promoting um, equity and diversity for women academics. All solutions. So the next question is about the material ways in which institutions are responding to the career impacts of COVID on women. Yeah, so what is happening? I have definitely seen quite a bit of optional tenure clock stopping, um, which I respect could relieve stress for some individuals. Um, I guess particularly if you are earlier in your career and you feel like you have that time. For me, I was horrified because, you know, it took nine years to land the tenure track position. I don't want another year toward tenure. Like, and I've been doing, you know, good work. So like, I knew I could get tenure. I was pretty confident I could get tenure without extending it. So I had to like opt out of the extension. Um, but then that's scary too, right? Because then what if I'm going to be judged for not taking it? But what I would really like to see is an adjustment of the expectations because this year was a wash and women shouldn't be paying for that year with delayed a tenure because delayed a tenure, it impacts, you get a big salary boost at tenure. You're available, you go up for other grant opportunities. You could be in a leadership role. This is going to impact your lifetime earnings, right? You're not going to make as much at retirement if you take a one-year tenure clock extension and then retire at the same time. And so there's some pretty big impacts to that, to taking that choice. And that puts the burden on the people who accept it, which is going to predominantly be women. So there's been a lot of that. It's good that it's an option, but, you know, I think it's dangerous to look at it. It's a Band-Aid solution. Um, there's been a decent amount of, of removal of the looking at student evaluations for tenure and promotion, which is good. And I hope to see that go even further and <laughs> just stay gone. Um, because we just know that that's not working out well for specific groups. Um, and another thing that I've seen is the development of some of these pandemic committees. Those have been developed. And so I think they're in development. So seeing what they're doing yet hasn't actually happened, but those committees are, are happening. And then also, I know at my institution, they've instituted a pandemic risk impact statement that we can put at the top of our um, it's not our CV at the top of our, it's not the cover letter. We like our narrative, our narrative evaluation. We can put a COVID impact statement at the top and they've linked to the PNAS article with, you know, hit these questions, um, which is, which is a just step in the you know right direction, but doesn't really say what they're going to do with that information. And there's always the fear that if you don't have a trained committee evaluating that, that it's opening up individuals to bias. So I like the direction it's going, but I'm, cautiously optimistic. But th that's what I've seen the most of. I haven't, you know, seen meaningful allocation of resources to equity yet, which is what I really want to see. Great. The next question is talking about uh, do incentives work for increasing gender equity or is the stick approach more effective? <laughs> I, I like the question. <laughs> it is a good question. I think the behavioral research tells us that incentives work better than the stick. Um, punishment isn't as effective as incentives, but then you also have, you know, does the institution have enough financial backing in terms of incentives um, that would work to actually induce change, which would be a big deal. So really, I mean, I think the best case scenario is to have buy-in um, and clear support and advocacy, particularly from upper admin and allies on campus who are in leadership positions. And that will make the biggest difference, I think. 
We have a question that's coming in the question box. It asks the question, says you may cover this in the PNAS piece, but I wonder if there are differences with respect to COVID-19 effects between faculty at small liberal arts universities versus research universities, or are the effects the same? Mm. I We didn't cover that. I am curious about that. Um, and I'm not sure if I've seen papers that have come out yet comparing those two. Um, I have some hunches, <laughs> but they're based just on hunches. Um, I think it has a lot to do with, did you lose access to your lab? You know, if you lose access to your lab and you're at a major R1, that's a very big impact where it might not be as big of an impact at a smaller institution um, or a small liberal arts college. Um, yeah, what seems like my gut would be that at a larger research institution where you lost access to your lab that will, and where research is really emphasized, that's gonna hit your potential at tenure and promotion harder than it would at a small liberal arts college. Next one is, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit of your opinion on the relationship between women in academia needing to be advocates for themselves to bring awareness and change to gender inequality in academia and their personal research time. Do you think <laughs> that the necessary time advocacy takes in some ways takes even more time away from pro professional women's research time? It's definitely a complex issue. And thank you for speaking. Yeah, that is a really excellent point. Um, it really is. I mean, finding the time to advocate is hard. It's hard to have any time. Um, and I was able to do this piece and get thrust into this world of advocating for um, women in academia because I had the AAUW fellowship. But if I didn't, I don't, I don't think I would have had the time to do it. And so there is that balance. Institutions need to value the work individuals are doing for advocacy work. Um, that way it will be more, you can make time for it. If your institution is not valuing it, then it's not gonna happen. Um, yeah, it really is a tough call. I mean, and I'll, you know, admit that I was motivated to write the piece because I was in, I was just really concerned. I was just feeling like I was seeing this train wreck for all women in academia unfolding. And like, I had to do something. And I even contacted my institution and said, what are you doing? And they said, nothing yet. It's not even, it's not even on the table because we're like dealing with the financial losses of losing, you know, sending undergrads home and losing room and board, which is a big deal at a residential college. You know, we're dealing with this big issue. We're dealing with that big issue. We're not even thinking about that your issue, not in, they didn't say it in a dismissive way at all. It was just like a reality, like we're, there's so much going on. That's not mm -hmm. even, about. that's when I was like, okay, then it needs to be thought about and I'm going to need to make, put it somewhere big where it can have an impact. Um, but it was a lot of work. I will say it was a lot of work. It's led to some amazing things. This talk, I got to give a talk for a European um, microbiology lab, which was really big. There was a letter to the editor about the paper and we got to respond to it. So although it was like one piece that we put together, it's, and, and actually several of the 17 co-authors. So that's what I've gotten out of the one paper. This has happened for lots of the co-authors. They've been invited to talks and things like that and making things happen. The beauty of us being at so many different institutions also is that like we all got accolades at our home institution for doing it and it's impacted those institutions. So, um, that was, that was another good way. If you can band together to get a bunch of people <laughs> to go in on your advocacy work, then you can all share in the rewards and give you other work to make it less of a time commitment. But if you find something you're really passionate about, you'll find the time. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Malish. We are going to wrap up now. Uh, I think this has been a great conversation. And I know that so many folks on the conversation have really benefited from um, you sharing. And also thanks to the audience who gave some really, really insightful questions. Um, we really know that 
these issues coming to the forefront is go, are really important because they have an impact on recovery. Eventually, there will be a COVID-19 recovery mm-hmm. and not there to be a gender lens uh, focus on the recovery. And we have to start thinking about that now so that women aren't an afterthought. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the recording will be available on the AAUW website. So you'll have an opportunity to look at many of the resources that Dr. Malish has pointed out. Uh, thank you also to the behind the scenes AAUW support team, uh, to Milan and to Nakia. Definitely visit aaw.org and find out about more opportunities that we are putting forth to our members uh, and to the general public um, through the Equity Network and through our other webinars um, for professional development. And uh, as a uh, uh, Professor Malish said earlier, if we would love it if you'd make a donation to AAUW, whether it's to, to help continue these kinds of programs. We definitely thank uh, our partners at GEICO for funding this opportunity this afternoon and for their support of women's career development. Uh, I encourage everyone, obviously, uh, during this pandemic, stay safe, uh, wear a mask. Uh, they, it's important. Uh, and also, uh, Dr. Malish, we want to give you the last word before we close out. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, And please visit the um, additional website for more resources where we list AAUW first. (laughs) That's a great resource to help women in academia. And yes, a second, please wear your mask, social distance, and stay safe. Thank you so much. Really appreciate everyone's participation and thank you very much. Have a good evening.